lecture 13. So, lecture 13 is all about colonial hydrology. So, I will explain what colonial hydrology is, I will explain the debate surrounding uh, colonial hydrology, whether colonial hydrology can be uh, you know considered as an appropriate scientific term or whether we can also you know uh, counter or critically interrogate uh, this particular terminology called colonial hydrology. So, all these questions uh, should be there should be evoked in your mind once you uh, you know go through uh, the various uh, slides in this presentation and uh, as it is a subjective thing. So, uh, you know this the discussion or the um, opinion uh, is very, uh, it can be open. So, it is not that you I will uh, try to impose a fixed uh, mindset or a fixed opinion on you, but rather what I will um, expect from you is that I will give you some facts and figures by covering uh, the various works by the several environmental and more specific water historians and then you should think and rethink that whether colonial hydrology is a proper scientific appropriate terminology or not. So, this is what we are going to do in this presentation. Now, to begin with what is colonial hydrology all about? What is colonial hydrology? How do we conceptualize and how do we define colonial hydrology? So, this is a question that uh, we should raise at the very beginning that is did the British experience comprise of an altogether distinct paradigm. Now, this is very important distinct paradigm for hydraulic interventions in South Asia. So, we know that you know if we go through the history of civilization, we will find that um, there was always a relationship between water and society. So, many a times the society people they had actually uh, tried to use water, abstract water, extract water and implemented several you know uh, uh, technologies to harness uh, water for, um, uh, for people's use, for basic use, for some amenities, for industrial purpose, for uh, domestic consumption, for agriculture purpose and all that. But now the question is so far as South Asia is concerned. Did the British experience that is from the time when South Asia came under the rule of the British came under the colonial rule. So, did the British introduce technologies or did the British introduce interventions technological interventions that can be considered as very much different or something unique from the preceding years. So, this is what uh, is the question all about that did it comprise of an altogether distinct a landmark a watershed paradigm for hydraulic interventions in South Asia. So, this is the question that uh, I have raised at the very beginning and this is the question which we would try to answer by some of the empirical facts that will be provided in this particular presentation. Yes, so we must talk about Rohan de Souza and his article uh, published in History Compass Journal in 2006 because Rohan uh, he uh, he uh, came up with this term uh, he uh, uh, you know uh, conceptualized uh, colonial hydrology uh, in uh, this particular article called uh, Water in British India: The Making of Colonial Hydrology. So he asks us uh, to you know um, to think uh, um, uh, or uh, to understand uh, colonial hydrology. As as a theoretical attraction to the entire hydraulic experience of uh, South Asia during the uh, rule of the British. Yeah, so, we need to understand the relationship between water and colonialism. So, water and society during the colonial rule. So, yes as I mentioned that um, I would give you some facts and figures uh, and these facts and figures I will be able to provide you from the works of the water historians who had uh, written extensively on water scenario mainly rural context of course, in uh, South Asia and mainly we will be covering north south glimpses from north south and eastern India. So, I will not be able to cover all the works, but I will be able to cover most of the significant works uh, on north south 
south in east india so why west is not there because uh, i mean uh, west is uh, I mean, so far as west is concerned there are not much works by environmental historians there is, uh, are one or two works by uh, scholars like uh, peter molinga and all who had focused on maharashtra uh, but uh, uh, i mean barring that we don't have much works on uh, western india but we have uh, ample works on uh, southern northern and eastern india on which i will be focusing on yeah so um, uh, to mention about this book and one particular article uh, called uh, from hydrology to hydrosocial history of waters in india so this will be another very important assignment for you so i will ask you to please go through chapter 16 of this particular book from where you will find uh, details of uh, you know details about the historiography of waters in india so please go through chapter 16 from the recently published uh, book called ratledge handbook of the history of sustainability edited by jeremy karadana you just need to go through chapter 16 yeah so, coming to the context of North India, in 1972 Elizabeth Whitcomb, she wrote a fascinating, a comprehensive, a path breaking book called Agrarian Conditions in Northern India. And uh, Elizabeth Whitcomb, she, uh, she uh, you know accessed uh, ample sources. So, so, I mean, so different administrative so sources, including uh, revenue reports, including lot of you know data on finance, on uh, land revenue, on uh, I mean, on what not. So she consulted uh, the rich archival uh, records uh, and evidences so far as Northwest Frontier Province is concerned. Uh, during that time, it was called the uh, it was the Northwest Frontier Province, consisting parts of Sindh and UP, and uh, she tried to study the uh, colonial uh, water hydraulic interventions in this particular uh, uh, districts of uh, UP and Sindh. And then she found out from these archival sources, from these uh, detailed uh, you know, um, uh, uh, reports, administrative reports, revenue reports and all that from these public reports that the uh, interventions in the form of intervention rather in the form of the perennial irrigation system that was introduced in Northwest Frontier province, it actually it actually did harm to the traditional uh, well irrigation system where the water society metabolism was, was much more uh, prominent uh, during the preceding times or the preceding years before the coming of the British. So, she showed that how uh, perennial irrigation actually had an adverse effect on the environment and the peasantry both. So, it had both environmental and social repercussions. So, she says that how these you know lengthy canals it ultimately led to you know saline deserts, waterlogged swamps and decreased soil fertility. So, on one hand the it uh, affected the production which affected the well being of the peasants. On the other hand there are as I mentioned some social aspects also to it because what happened is that now uh, with this uh, colonial uh, perennial irrigation system. Uh, the rich landlords, they were uh, um, uh, given lot of ownership uh, so far as the control of the distribution uh, channels were concerned and uh, so uh, and there were uh, other local officers who were involved in the collection of tax. So, on the uh, one hand already there was this problem of water logging and soil fertility which was uh, affecting the um, you know production and on the other hand the peasants were also exploited by these rich landlords and uh, the uh, tax collectors. Uh, so, what happened ultimately was that depressed peasantry labored in a distorted environment. So, this is the path breaking uh, argument that uh, Whitcomb uh, made uh, during the 70s and this can be uh, considered as one of the major uh, you know volumes as one of the major uh, 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 book or major contribution so far as uh, water history in colonial in North India is concerned. So, then um, uh, I would like to cite another uh, work uh, shedding light on another aspect which is the flood control uh, aspect and uh, not only flood control, but more specifically warning systems. Uh, 
So, warning systems prevalent during the pre colonial period and the warning system prevalent during the uh, colonial period, but more importantly, you know, um, he says that how. Um, they used to maintain what he calls a social technology of communication. This is fascinating social technology of communication, which was cost effective, which was totally based on you know uh, uh, relationship and kinship and uh, uh, very interesting kind of social communications that were prevalent uh, between the upstream and the downstream people. So, in that way through those informal uh, uh, you know arrangements through those informal network uh, how these people before the coming of the British they used to maintain a very um, uh, useful and effective traditional warning system, but unfortunately how the, uh, when the British came how this system was totally replaced and how flood uh, became a fiasco in uh, North India especially in the Indus valley and especially Benjamin Will uh, focuses on a particular town called Deragazi. And uh, he talks about flood that uh, occurred in Deragazi and ultimately what happened that entire town had to be relocated. So, this was the history. So, it was flooded in such a uh, I mean in, in such a disastrous way that ultimately the people and ultimately the entire town had to be relocated. So, he gives examples from uh, the massive floods that had occurred in 1841, 1843 and all that. So, um, so he makes a comparison uh, um, and also he talks about the conflict between the local knowledge based approach and technological mentality of the engineers. So, the uh, so uh, we will also see uh, when we will discuss uh, about Eastern India that how flood was seen as a curse. So, the in the pre colonial period people used to visualize you know people used to understand perceive floods not as threat or as a curse, but as blessing as boon because floods were very important because floods gave a silt. Mm, or alluvium, uh, alluvial uh, b, 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 soil uh, so, so the alluvial uh, quantity or uh, the alluvium uh, deposits in the soil uh, were very important for the soil fertility or production. So, they understood that yes once the flood waters would reci reside, uh, recede sorry, uh, then the field would be left with uh, silt that would be very important for the production process, but unfortunately the colonizers with lot of technological you know superiority uh, technological chauvinism these engineers they wanted to uh, come up with big embankments on the Indus river. So, that flood can be controlled flood can be you know uh, 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 totally regulated at the very beginning. So, complex engineering works it replaced the traditional warning system and mobility undermining alluvial farming systems as well as a precautionary approach to environmental management. So, as I was trying to explain that Benjamin Wills article is very unique in a sense that he not only talks about that you know uh, how flood was perceived as a curse during the colonial period and how uh, the colonial engineers totally concentrated on flood management rather than you know post flood uh, uh, harvesting or production. Uh, agricultural production uh, mechanisms, but he also talks about that how a very um, I mean what to say colloquial uh, a very traditional kind of a cost effective kind of a uh, warning system was totally replaced uh, you know when this uh, British came and then when they came up with this laudable uh, hydraulic interventionist uh, mechanisms. So, so far as uh, the North India is concerned there are other writings as well. Uh, um, so, I am citing Indu Agnihotri's work uh, on the canal colonies of Punjab and David J. Martin's work uh, uh, on um, a theoretical uh, framework mainly uh, which he calls imperial science and tries to map uh, the or uh, trace the effects of imperial science on uh, the hydrological or the hydraulic uh, configurations of uh, South Asia especially uh, you know, India North India again. So, Indu Agnihatri uh, the work uh, it shows that how the colonial canal system in Punjab it overran the existing inundation canal system the same story everywhere we will see the same thing when we will be discussing eastern India and also overflow irrigation in east India. So, uh, what happened is that uh, the uh, the pastoral the local pastoral economy uh, the local uh, pastoralist way of um, uh, way of uh, tilling the soil and uh, their way of uh, you know uh, agricultural production it was totally hampered when this perennial uh, colon uh, uh, you know uh, colonial uh, irrigation uh, 
uh, mechanism uh, it was implemented and it was transplanted over the uh, traditional uh, inundation uh, canal system that was already existing in uh, Punjab. David Gil, um, Gil Martin comes up with a conceptual or a theoretical framework which he calls imperial science. imperial science and uh, so techno chauvinism of imperial science this is a very important uh, argument that he makes and she, he says that you know uh, these uh, uh, interventions were also thickly loaded with uh, the uh, you know uh, with the kind of technological uh, superiority that these engineers uh, were possessing so the the, the eurocentric uh, notion of uh, you know uh, um, the eurocentric notion of we are the best and the eurocentric notion of uh, our techniques and our technologies uh, can do anything uh, in the world it can tame the rivers it can uh, manage floods it can uh, you know uh, i mean it can tap tame uh, do whatever it wants to do so far as ecological resources uh, are concerned whether it is uh, uh, forest whether it is water bodies whether it is wetlands these this kind of a chauvinistic attitude was very much there in the technologies that the colonizers implemented uh, during uh, the British rule in colonial India. So, this is what Jill Martin uh, emphasizes and talks about in his 1994 article on uh, imperial science. And what was the result? Uh, of course, the result uh, was uh, like uh, socially and environmentally, uh, I mean social and environmental disruptions. So, these interventions were of course, uh, as we have seen in the earlier um, cases as well. So, these were socially and environmentally uh, disruptive and there is no doubt about this and, uh, and, and he also talks about the uh, centralized control uh, that was implemented uh, under the aegis of the irrigation department. So, previously uh, the, the entire water system or water management business to a great extent it was decentralized. So, it is mainly owned managed managed uh, by the communities, uh, but supervised and monitored of course, by kings and rulers and all. But then uh, with the establishment of the irrigation department, everything uh, uh, became centralized and under the EGs and under the control of the irrigation department. So, maybe I am making some linear uh, comments and arguments here. Uh, I will give a caution or I will generate a caution in the uh, next part of this presentation. So, do not think that I am trying to you know, uh, you know uh, create the binary uh, between uh, the golden uh, pre colonial age and the um, disruptive uh, you know, uh, colonial age. I am not uh, doing this kind of, so this kind of uh, unsophistication. Uh, I am not uh, trying to uh, talk about or bring in in the lecture, but I am the just now right now I mean I am uh, just introducing you with the arguments made by these uh, water historians or environmental historians uh, in their uh, articles. So, we have ample uh, scope and ample time later to think and rethink and uh, counter and criticize uh, their arguments. So, that that will be an entirely different uh, exercise, but this uh, uh, um, uh, the presentation the objective or the purpose of the presentation is to evoke all these questions uh, in your mind. Yeah. So, coming to South India, I will not cite uh, much work, but one recent work uh, uh, by Eswara Rao, very interesting title, Taming Liquid Gold and Dam Technology. So, he has mainly focused on the Godavari Anikar uh, in South India. So, this is a chapter um, in uh, Deepak Kumar Vineta Damodaran and Rohan Dizosa's edited book called Environmental Encounters in uh, South Asia. So, here uh, Rao um, uh, he uh, sheds light on the history of the construction of the uh, Godavari um, Anikat uh, during the 50s and uh, he shows that uh, just during the preceding years that is roughly between 1815 and 1840. So, he consulted the archival uh, reports and records to find out that there was a kind of a colonial anxiety and apprehension that uh, the production was actually falling. So, there was the uh, agriculture, so there, there were a lot of worries and anxieties relating to agricultural uh, production. And so, uh, Montgomery, he was uh, asked to you know uh, survey the entire condition and come up with some recommendations and solutions. So, what happened is that Montgomery finally uh, could publish a report, um, he came up with a report uh, in 1843 44, which is known as the famous Montgomery report. And Arthur Cotton, he was uh, trained in civil engineering, of course. 
So, he was uh, uh, brought in uh, to the picture and he was involved in this entire project of uh, coming up with a um, anicut uh, on the Godavari river and the main purpose was to uh, facilitate uh, inland navigation and also to, um, to increase uh, agricultural production and all that. So, what happened is that an Arthur Cotton we all know Arthur Cotton was uh, again to use little bit of I mean if you follow the of if you follow David Jean Martin's um, conceptual framework then Arthur Cotton was no less than an uh, you know imperial uh, scientist and to a great extent a uh, techno chauvinist because uh, Arthur Cotton's famous argument is that all, uh, all deltas are delta all over the world. So, so he says that there is uh, there are no specific uh, distinctions uh, you know between a delta in South Asia or a delta somewhere else. So, he says all deltas are deltas across you know all over the world. So, uh, if all deltas are deltas all over the world then we have the mechanism to do whatever we want to do to the delta for our own benefits and for reaping uh, profits and for not only reaping, but also maximizing uh, profits by generating lot of revenue and lot of earnings on the um, uh, expenditure or the in investments made or conquered. So, Arthur Cotton uh, was involved in the project and finally, we, we see that uh, uh, there were some improvements. Uh, so, commercial crops like uh, sugar cane, uh, tobacco, coconut uh, things were uh, raised and uh, and it also uh, gave rise to so as I mentioned that these uh, hydraulic intervention it not only had uh, the environmental repercussions, but also social repercussions. So, we see the uh, rise of um, rich capitalist farmers uh, like th these uh, communities like Kamas, Redis, Rajulus, Kapus, Telegas, Gavaras. Uh, so, Eswara Rao um, uh, talks about all of them and so of course, on one hand there was the rise of capitalist farmers and on one hand the misery of the poor tenants and the agricultural laborers it uh, went on increasing. So, and the ecological effect was that after few years uh, the salinity rose, there was water logging and also crop disease started, Jalagarogam, crop disease, cattle disease, soil was exhausted and also there was decrease in uh, fish production. And uh, one important thing I should mention here is that uh, as I see the name of Eswara Rao's uh, uh, chapter, book chapter Taming Liquid Gold. So, Arthur Cotton was someone who even you know represented, tried to represent the river in terms of money, in terms of capital. So, so if there's a, so he mentions. So, if you go through Cotton's report, you will find that Cotton says that uh, you know the Godavari it uh, generates. If I remember uh, it rightly, so it uh, generates uh, roughly uh, four two zero 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 for twenty thousand uh, cubic yards. So, for twenty thousand cubic yards of water go to the sea per day which is that is. So, he converted it and said that the rate is rupees 500. So, for 20,000 cubic yards of water going to the sea at the rate of rupees 500 per hour sorry at the rate of rupees 500 per hour that is rupees 12,000 per day across 240 days which finally gives a figure of 2880000 rupees so can you imagine so the entire godavari calculated in terms of money so this is what he did so he rep represented the entire flow of the godavari in terms of money and he measured that so to him godavari was liquid gold so, this was the kind of uh, the mentality the colonizers had so far as our uh, you know rivers uh, are concerned. Yes, so now coming to uh, Eastern India, uh, Eastern India um, uh, one major development during the colonial times was the permanent settlement uh, uh, in the Bengal province that is consisting of Bengal, Bihar and Orissa. So, I think I had mentioned it uh, earlier as well in some of my uh, slides or lectures that is previously I mean the basic difference uh, between the pre-colonial and colonial rule uh, was that uh, you know uh, in during the pre-colonial period flood was never perceived as a curse. 
or uh, you know flood was never perceived as a negative thing so flood was always perceived as a blessing as a boon because it was uh, totally there in the mind of the people yes that uh, you know um, uh, floods were extremely important uh, because uh, uh, when this flood water would reach it then the, the soil would be left with uh, very rich uh, silt or alluvium deposits but unfortunately uh, uh, you know um, the colonizers their understanding of floods was absolutely different or, or totally different from uh, the pre colonial understanding of flood because they fixed the revenue in eastern india especially if you see permanent settlements so permanent settlement was something where they tried to fix the entire uh, revenue so what happened was that previous uh, taxation system it was not a fixed taxation system it totally depended on uh, the the uh, what to say the uh, the um, uh, opportunity and the opportunities available um, i mean seasonal opportunities available and the, uh, the droughts and floods during those time taxes were not collected rather during those time loans were provided by the state or by the rulers and even the local uh, uh, i mean local rulers to the peasants so, but the colonizers were not comfortable in uh, that kind of an arrangement and what they wanted to do was they wanted to continuously uh, extract revenue from the soil so as they want, so as this became continuous so from irregular or uh, discontinuous system of trans, uh, taxation to continuous or fixed system of taxation so it was mandatory for them to uh, you know to uh, regulate floods to control floods because otherwise during those months uh, i mean uh, the there would be uh, some kind of costs which were involved um, on land so that is why uh, they uh, initially they uh, uh, you know they uh, implemented uh, the idea of uh, constructing embankments on the rivers to control and regulate flood water so if if you see eastern india you will find that uh, big big embankments were constructed on all the rivers of eastern india including kosi gandak damodar ganges all the rivers and what happened is that the overflow irrigation that is the traditional irrigation system was totally replaced by or totally replaced by the era of um, embankment or the era of embankment construction and we see uh, very interestingly there is a work by da daniel klingen smith we will talk about it where klingen smith had showed that how actually even some of the colonial officials they pointed out that overflow irrigation was extremely productive for the peasants and for the soil which the british uh, unfortunately did not try to understand so rohan this was mainly focusing on the um, uh, on orissa on colonial orissa he shows that how uh, the construction of embankment actually did not do any benefit to the river or the people for that matter but rather it totally you know disrupted uh, uh, environmental and social equations so he shows how um, the landscape of orissa it actually transformed from flood dependent agrarian region to flood vulnerable landscape yes so now uh, as i uh, told you in the beginning of the lecture that we will you know little bit play with this term colonial hydrology i am not going to impose uh, this term on you but rather you are uh, supposed to think that whether we are colonial hydrology is an appropriate terminology or not because till now i had only talked about the negative uh, aspects of uh, colonial hydraulic interventions but there are few works which also uh, um, uh, you know uh, which also do not uh, talk about uh, this binary distinction between pre colonial and uh, colonial water regime rather they say that a few works argue that you know there is a kind of a continuity between the pre colonial and uh, colonial period so far as water management is concerned there are other works for example ironstone ironstone had um, uh, countered elizabeth whitcomb so ironstone uh, writing uh, during the uh, 19 uh, writing during 1985 uh, she, uh, he uh, had countered elizabeth whitcomb and uh, he has shown that actually canals in the northwest uh, was a source of economic dynamism and constant innovation so whitcomb said that the depressed uh, peasantry uh, they walked in a distorted environment but stone says that uh, you know with uh, the same a similar kind of or a different kind of archival records and reports he says that uh, canals were a source of economic dynamism and constant innovation 
So, we need to think about this. So, this is one. Then uh, there are works on South India. For example, Eswara Rao, we have seen how he has shown that Arthur Cotton, uh, he has actually you know to a great extent criticized Arthur Cotton and criticized the colonial hydraulic interventions uh, on river Godavari. But on the other hand, Peter uh, Shkitme, uh, Shkit uh, manner, I do not know the appropriate pronunciation, but uh, see, with the same uh, the, uh, the another person in the same edited volume of uh, uh, Deepak Kumar, Vinita Damodaran and Rohan uh, Dizoza, where Eswara Rao also had contributed at an article. He has actually said that you know maybe the Godavari, uh, uh, so far as Godavari was concerned. Uh, the project was extremely disruptive, but if we consider other projects, for example, mainly deltas of Go, uh, Kaveri, but also he includes Godavari and says that uh, these were less environmentally disruptive. So they are, uh, I mean, these are not closed, and we cannot come up with closed end arguments, but rather these are open-ended, uh, you know, uh, perspectives which we need to uh, think and rethink, counter and en uh, encounter, and also uh, we need to uh, go through fresh set of uh, sources, sometimes maybe and fresh uh, 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 sets of frameworks to continuously uh, keep on uh, thinking and interpreting that uh, what is the truth or what is the uh, reality or maybe be also this kind of an understanding that whether there are multiple realities or not. Hardiman also talks about uh, the same thing, I mean not same thing, Hardiman says that prison indebtedness uh, was already there during the pre-colonial period, so it predated the pre-colonial regime. So, it is not that it only started with the colonial period. So, I mean this kind of an uh, understanding or framework of uh, pre-colonial equilibrium versus colonial hydrology actually does not hold ground. So, again uh, works by David Moss and works by Isha Shah. So, Isha Shah has uh, she has done a detailed oral history and uh, you know ethnographic study uh, in uh, South India and she has mainly Karnataka and she has shown that how uh, so, so she has consulted the folklores and the traditional uh, some of the traditional cultural practices. So, where she has shown that how you know the, the, the water management techniques were very um, disruptive uh, so far as the social equations were concerned. So, for example, if there was a long uh, prolonged drought uh, in uh, the villages of Karnataka, then there was a ritual practice that the tri that a tribal women or a Dalit women uh, from a very uh, vulnerable or marginalized uh, section um, of that uh, village. Uh, uh, was supposed to you know drown herself uh, in a well and this was uh, there was a cultural belief uh, and uh, I mean uh, of course a superstition associated with the whole thing that if her life was sacrificed then it would ensure rains in that particular village. So, these were the kind of um, systems or practices or rituals that were there even in pre-colonial India. So, how can we say that the pre-colonial India was a golden period so far as water management uh, is concerned or was concerned. So, finally, I will end this presentation uh, again uh, by uh, what to say by by narrating my observations because I am in a position to uh, to tell you what I believe in and then you are free to think you know uh, in your own way. So, uh, the idea of this presentation or here I do not want to impose my ideas on you, but of course, I will share my opinions and my observation and then you can you, you, you can go through those reference materials, you can go through the articles, you can go through the book chapters and then you can have your own thinking and thoughts related to whether colonial hydrology is a scientific term or not. So, I will say that definitely though um, I have uh, talked about the uh, different uh, other works by Esha Shah or Ironstone or David Moss and pointed out that this kind of a uh, uh, colonial versus pre-colonial or pre-colonial versus colonial actually does not hold ground in that sense. But again in spite of that I will also argue and uh, to a great extent you know uh, I very much agree with Rohan de Souza that um, the greatest momentum that the colonial period it was I mean it, it, it forged in the greatest momentum of hydraulic transition in India and we cannot really deny this. Because even if we look into some of the legal procedures, some of the institutional arrangements, some of the acts that were passed uh, during the colonial time, we will see that how it entirely altered the ecological and social equations so far as water management was concerned. For because uh, the British were doing everything to generate a pecuniary value. So, the rule of profit was the 
main uh, colonial logic behind all this intervention and there is no doubt you know um, I mean the, so we, we cannot be really doubtful about the this affair. And it was of course, the era of uh, scientific management and uh, as I was mentioning about the act. So, if we see the uh, canal drainage act of 1873 or if we look into the establishment of the irrigation department okay, in the second half of the 19th century, then we will see that the previously everything was uh, to a great extent uh, owned by the community, but now the canal drainage act and the uh, irrigation department they employed uh, through the canal drainage act and through the establishment of uh, irrigation department they employed a so called trained engineers and so called trained uh, technocrats who were controlling uh, or who were um, who set up an absolute control over the flow pattern distribution and allocation of water resource. So, these things are very important see flow pattern distribution and allocation. We had discussed political ecology right, we had discussed urban political ecology or we uh, will discuss or elaborate more on it in our next uh, some of our next presentations. So, they where we will say that it is not only pipes. I mean it is not only water which flows through price, but it is also power equations. So, here it is absolutely clear that during the poly, uh, colonial uh, period itself the flow pattern where these pipes would be laid, who would get access to water, who would be able to pay taxes. And there are so many other you know um, uh, complexities, caste, kinship, gender, so many other things, so many other social aspects that are very much there uh, in, 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 in uh, so far as the access uh, to water uh, was concerned. So, it was not only quantity and quality of water, but uh, who were actually controlling uh, the flow of water, the flow pattern of rivers, the distribution uh, of channels and the allocation um, uh, to water resources. So, this is there and then of course, um, the as I had mentioned uh, talked about Jill Martin's paradigm of imperial science. So, uh, there was this cultural dominance of engineering paradigm. So, where uh, it was uh, uh, asserted time and again that the colonial hydraulic interventions were more sophisticated, they were heavy, they were big, they were more effective than the traditional uh, systems. And so, community was replaced by metaphor of machines including stop dams, weirs and what not and then entire era of you know centralized control uh, began. And uh, of course, uh, we had discussed little bit uh, uh, of the uh, ecological uh, repercussions or the ecological effects of these big hydraulic interventions. So, uh, so the embankment regime, uh, it is clearly, it has been clearly shown if you go through the works of Dizoza, Dinesh Mishra, uh, so many other uh, uh, social scientists and scholars as well, it comes out clearly that the embankment regime, it uh, actually could not regulate flood or control flood rather it aggravated uh, uh, floods uh, in uh, India uh, uh, more specifically in uh, North India and Eastern India. Uh, so, what happened is that uh, so uh, when this uh, embankment regime could not actually regulate flood and could actually aggravate flood then this uh, techno chauvinist they actually came up with more fears uh, and so called what they considered to be scientific and effective um, interventions that replaced the uh, embankment regime. So, then the perennial irrigation system was introduced and finally, these particular uh, uh, I mean these uh, uh, water management mechanisms laid way to what is known as the era of multipurpose river value development projects that is the era of dam construction. So, technological interventions had to be contextualized within the broader political economic uh, picture within the we have to know we have to understand the broader uh, you know historical processes that are at work political economic imperatives that are at play that determine technological choices of a particular period. So, what I would like to say is that uh, today we are um, you know we are we are um, encountering severe challenges uh, relating to you know uh, dam construction uh, relating to the effects of big dams on 
people on ecology but we have to keep in mind that it is uh, it, it was it was uh, it was not a sudden or an abrupt uh, or a new phenomena in post independent india but rather it drew its uh, legacy from the colonial period which started with the embankment regime followed by perennial uh, regime uh, irrigation uh, canal regime uh, and that finally laid way to the multi purpose river valley development projects which would be uh, the topic for our next lecture thank you